we can start. Um, you know, impact investing is one of those concepts that uh, for skeptical journalists like me sounds a bit like a contradiction. You know, how can it be, as we will discuss today, that investment can meet a triple bottom line, economic, social, and environmental? You know, aren't profit margins supposed to uh, come at the expense of social and environmental gains? Uh, but we have five people here today who I believe will convince us that it is possible to create both financial returns and positive social and environmental impact. Um, a few numbers just to set a little bit of context. In 2012, Impact Investing garnered $8 billion in committed capital, and the median investment was about $25 million. Today, there are only around 200 Impact Investment-specific funds, but this is obviously a growth field. Uh, governments, in particular, are committed to expanding the social impact of their investments. The uh, UK Pension Fund, for instance, by the end of next year, hopes that about half of its uh, holdings will involve impact investment. And forecasts, which of course are infinitely fungible, put the uh, impact investment uh, at anywhere from $500 billion to $1 trillion uh, by 2020. So that's the good news. The uh, challenge in doing all of this um, is quite significant. First of all, this can't be simply the uh, business of international finance institutions or of foundations or of rich people who want to save the world. Uh, you really have to get mainstream investors involved. And governments also really need to create a climate that's more conducive to such investing and figure out the proper regulatory framework uh, to protect investments. And finally, we need to figure out how to measure this triple bottom line. Um, the way that you measure economic impact and environmental impact and social impact, and they're very different. Um, so here to discuss these issues with us today are five people who either are committing to financial impact investment uh, or people who analyze uh, this growth market. And I thought we, what we would do is just have a very quick introduction from each of the panelists, you know, who they are, what they do. Um, I'll start with uh, Keely Stevenson on my right, who is the CEO of Bamboo Finance, which is a global private equity firm uh, that invests in growth stage businesses in 25 countries. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mingalaba to everyone here. Um, and I just want to quickly say to your point of, uh, uh, you know, how could this be about the balancing or, or but, you know, or why, basically, why not? We live in a world where it's demanding now that we create these, uh, these types of businesses to create the world we want to live in. Um, so uh, Bamboo Finance, uh, we started in 2007 and with the intent to improve the lives of low-income people. We decided to use an approach of private equity, so we launched two commercial private equity funds. Um, we raised $250 million. And we've um, invested almost all of this in businesses that improve the lives of low-income people in areas like healthcare, energy, water resources, housing. Um, our, uh, we have two um, private equity funds. And our investors are a range. Initially started off with individuals, um, high net worth individuals, family offices. And we also um, have investors that are a pension fund, a sovereign wealth fund, and it's quite global. So um, investors are pretty much from all parts of, of the world. Um, uh, as uh, Hannah mentioned, we have uh, 46 investments um, in 25 countries. Uh, and um, we have five offices uh, around the world and a team of 29 people. Um, and uh, you know, our, it, it's only been uh, six years. Um, so it's still fairly early on um, to, you know, in terms of performance of these companies. But we have had some significant indicators that there's a great social impact. Um, we've also had one exit. Um, so we have a 23% IRR return from that um, exit. And we have two more in the horizon in the next uh, year or so. Um, and now that we've almost fully invested these two funds, we've decided to launch uh, two new ones. And one is focused all on um, energy uh, for uh, the base of pyramid or low-income communities. Um, and the other is an extension of our first fund, which is um, all focused on financial inclusion. So including things like microfinance, which our colleague here does, um, and uh, financial service platforms, uh, things like this. So our thesis really is that um, 
serving low-income people um, with dignity, with a market approach, is no more risky um, or costly um, than any other um, market. And it's actually a really huge opportunity to create the world that we all want to live in. And bamboo, where did that name come from? Bamboo actually is a, a symbolic, um, you know, it means it's auspicious in many cultures, but it's also quite resilient and, and grows anywhere and it's quite alive. Uh, and so I think that's very representative of our, of our team and our commitment to, um, to that which is, is natural and which will grow under extreme circumstances. And you're wearing bamboo green. That's right. <laughs> I'm decked out in our uniform. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, uh, Don Lam is the uh, CEO and co-founder of Vienna Capital Group in Vietnam, um, and I believe that you're also beginning to explore the Myanmar market as well. Yes. Uh, just a little bit about who we are. Um, we, we are about nine years old. Uh, we currently manage about $1.5 billion uh, across a number of asset class. Uh, our funds are closed and listed in London, uh, and our current focus is Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and we are setting up an office in uh, Myanmar. Uh, we also run a foundation called Vina Capital Foundation, uh, which is one of the largest uh, foundation NGO in Vietnam. Uh, so from that, <clears throat> and also from investors that invest in our current fund, uh, with the request of us looking into impact investment, that's why we're here, and it's, it's a process of us setting up a new uh, impact investment fund, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about it later. Okay. Um, Chris Stegelmeyer. Stegelmeyer? Stegelmeyer. I'm sorry. I'm Good. I also went for in between those two pronunciations. <laughs> is the uh, executive director of the Center for Social Innovation at Stanford University, and uh, you've been living in Myanmar since December. Correct. So I'm here with two hats. One, as you mentioned, is the executive director for the Center for Social Innovation at Stanford, which is relevant to what we'll talk about impact investing. I have been on loan to another institute at Stanford, living in Yangon here since December, focused on innovation in developing economies. So the Center for Social Innovation, because that's where we drive most of our thought and research and ideas around impact investing, is focused at social change at the intersection of business, government, and nonprofits. We're fanatical about it. We've looked at social innovations that have scaled the past 30 years, and it's those that happen at that intersection that are able to grow. And so those are new, novel ideas that are more effective and efficient than existing ideas and that drive public value. As an academic center, we do three things, raise awareness, build skills, and inspire action. It's not enough anymore to just know about what to do, it's about driving action on the <clears throat> ground. And you know, we do what traditional academic centers do, research, cases, courses. I've got three courses on impact investing. Uh, and so that's my hat on social innovation. And then this institute, my job has been really in factories on the ground, seeing what the opportunities are here in Myanmar. So talk about that too. And uh, Andy Tafan Garuda Putro has the, uh, is the founder of Amarta Microfinance, which is a Grameen-based microfinance operation uh, that focuses on affordable financial services in low-income yeah. rural areas in Indonesia. Yeah, correct. Okay, uh, just a brief uh, about my organization. So it just started uh, three years ago. Um, uh, we started as a a small project. Um, I started with not a big investment. Actually, I started with ten thousand uh, US dollar. It's quite small. And then uh, <coughs> today we have uh, reached to uh, three thousand clients. Uh, more than fifty villages we already serve, and we manage outstanding portfolio out of three hundred and three hundred thousand US dollars with uh, zero defaults. So we can manage all the investment, all the. Uh, loans uh, effectively, and uh, the nice thing about the microfinance that uh, we do here, um, it, it started with just uh, a simple uh, microfinance scheme that it's effective way to address poverty, but then if we talk about in like a country in Indonesia, um, it's uh, things become uh, an, in, an important tool, in important tools to address uh, issue like poverty because um, in Indonesia, uh, total population, we have uh, 200, uh, 240,000 uh, million people, uh, but then uh, 100 uh, million people still living below uh, poverty line, so it's uh, going to be an important tool to, uh, like, yeah, to address this kind of social issues. Mm -hmm. and 
that's uh, the reason why uh, I started this kind of microfinance things. And uh, finally, Omar Lodi is the uh, partner in Singapore-based regional head for the Abraj Group. Uh, and I was reading that in 2008, you had introduced a proprietary bespoke index to measure the development uh, impact of investments. Tell us more. So we're a traditional private equity firm, for profit. Um, and we operate only across what we call growth markets, so emerging markets, Africa, Latin America, Asia, MENA. And while for profit, and we manage seven and a half billion, we have over, I guess, 150 portfolio companies or partner companies, as we call them. And where and whereby for profit remains the central mantra to of our objective uh, and our investors, we pay equal credence and importance to long-term sustainability practices within uh, our partner companies because we feel that the two are synonymous and go hand in hand. And profit maximization is not possible without sustainability practices across all your economic and corporate activities. And, and the index, which we can talk about later, is there to actually measure uh, the impact, because it's all very well talking about these things and trying to implement practices. But if you don't measure your impact, then you're not going to sort of be able to improve upon it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I thought maybe what we could do now is talk more specifically about the projects that you're involved in, the challenges, the opportunities. Um, Keely, if I could circle back to you on this. Sure. Yeah, our, our portfolio is quite diverse. So we have um, some examples would be we have um, a large investment in the first student loan business in Mexico. Um, we also have an investment in um, India that's a rice husk. Uh, they use the byproduct of rice husk in order to electrify rural villages. Um, another example is um, a healthcare company in South Africa that um, has been around for a long time. And as a, a very large group, they have managed care, um, they, which is networks of doctors and dentists and laboratories. They have a pharmaceutical manufacturing business um, and distribution company and HIV management company. And although there's huge social impact in this kind of business, it's not the typical type of thing that we would invest in unless there was a direct impact on low-income communities. Mm -hmm. So in, in this example, the company actually created um, a low-cost product for um, workers in like mining, manufacturing, who don't have access to um, affordable health care. So for about $20, which they share with their employer, so they pay about $10, they get unlimited primary care doctor's visits, acute and chronic drugs. So that includes things like HIV or diabetes treatment, um, dentistry and optometry, which is quite critical for a lot of wow. people that are. Um, so the reason that this was possible is actually because that company had economies of scale already. Um, and the, the interesting, for us, the really interesting thing is that they also have many uh, middle income clients as well that they're serving. And as a healthcare company, they're looking at a significant amount of data and, and they have a strong MIS system. So they're actually able to compare the utilization of low income uh, clients with middle income clients and they're finding almost no difference in the sense that they're no riskier, no more expensive, um, with the exception of dentistry because mostly low income uh, clients hadn't been to the dentist um, most of their life and so the initial cost of coming to the dentist was a little bit higher. Um, in, uh, you know, in a couple of other examples there, um, in, in healthcare, um, we've also invested in the largest and first uh, chain of rural and semi-urban hospitals in India. Um, and it's also another um, young global leader colleague of mine, um, Ashwin Naik, who started this. Um, and their model is quite interesting because what they decided to do in 2009, um, we invested $4 million and they had four hospitals and now they're at 17 hospitals. These are in very remote areas where people would um, typically have to walk or to, to travel anyways about 100 uh, kilometers to actually get access to a hospital. They have um, OB OBGYN services, they have uh, surgery, um, they have a pharmacy, um, diagnostics, and their whole, their whole model is finding local talent um, they have nursing and training services for nurses locally. They uh, procure all of their, um, their supplies um, 
in, you know, jointly, which keeps the cost down, and they're asset light, so they're not actually buying, uh, building facilities, they're leasing some of these mm. facilities. But the key <laughs> thing between all of these uh, enterprises is that the entrepreneurs know really, really well these customers. So in the case of Vatsalia, the, the, the key thing is that they know what the services are that the customers are looking for, but also the doctors are trained on um, you know, aspects of how to communicate with doctors. With the, the, they're on the, ra the local radio, they're in the health camps. It's about that feeling of kind of oneness um, with the client that has made them very successful. Um, so that's a, just to give you uh, some examples of our, of our portfolio. Um, Omar, you know, when you think about impact investment, often health, education, uh, microfinances are naturals, but you could argue that there are other types of investment that have deep social and, and environmental impacts. And uh, I believe that there's something in Pakistan that you're working on, on power generation, um, which fits a sort of slightly non-traditional mode of impact investing, if you wouldn't mind elaborating on that. I mean, firstly, you know, we, we invest across all sectors, um, and, and we probably invested. There's not a single industry we haven't invested in. And <clears throat> some sectors, obviously, your, the ability to sort of make more social impact is greater, power generation being one of them. So it's a good case study to talk about. But at the heart of every company lies a whole set of stakeholders. And we believe that by adopting that stakeholder approach, and not a single shareholder approach. That is how you are able to build sustainable businesses which tick all of those three or multiple boxes, right? And it can be in any industry, it can be in any sector, it can be in any country. So at the, at the core of it lies the stakeholder approach. The second important mantra for us is that, you know, sometimes we all make ESG a black box, right? We have panel sessions like this on it, not to derate this panel session, but you know, it's, it's also organizations, of course, some of us, it's a cosmetic tick box exercise. Others embrace it, but it's not part of mainstream business. It's actually, it's everyday living. I was telling you before the panel, we as human beings, we educate ourselves, we look after our health, we try and sort of, you know, elongate our living and make us good Human beings do good. It's exactly the same peril that you take for a company. And if our goal is to maximize profit, which it is, over the long term, if you're not going to treat your customers well, your employees well, your environmental well, environmental well, you are not going to, over the long term, sustain and maximize your profit. And where we have a five to 10 year horizon, it's not just about the period in which we run that business, when we come to sell that business, the incoming buyer has to be equally attracted to pay us maximum value. Mm. So it's a very long-term, and it has to be necessarily a long-term objective. KESC, Karachi Electric Supply Corporation, <clears throat> is a uh, utility power generation distribution transmission asset servicing uh, the city of Karachi, which is 18 million people. So it's a little unique. It's, it, was, it was a prior government asset which was privatized in 05. It was a broken asset. Mm -hmm. Its stakeholders, the government, its employees, its customers, retail customers, business customers, the media, the community, they all hated KESC. Inside, it was completely corrupt. It was eroded. They were unionized, politicized. It had 40% transmission and distribution losses. It hadn't made a profit for the last 15 years of its life. And there was no, not surprisingly, Karachi was without electricity for several hours in the day. For all our sins and whatever we, we were thinking, we came in with a management controlling stake. And because we saw a very simple financial uh, uh, goal and, 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 and solution, that 40% TND losses were causing the profit. If you reduce those, for every 1% reduction in TND, you could increase EBITDA by $15 million. However, as simple as that may sound, turning around KSC with all of these embedded stakeholders who had an extremely long, dispassionate, sour relationship with the company was not going to be easy. 18,000 employees, by the way. So if we didn't approve, 
adopt a stakeholder approach, there was never going to be any way that we were going to succeed. And the stakeholder approach and the for-profit approach were unanimous and synonymous and, and complementary in most of cases. We increased generation by 1,000 megawatts. That obviously improved power supply, and we uh, reduced TND losses. It improved power supply to the community, to the city, increased economic activity. We targeted 16 hospitals, which accounted for 80% of medical treatment in, in Karachi, gave them uninterrupted power supply. We went into the community. We built um, you know, sporting facilities uh, for the youth to give them empowerment. We, the flood, uh, Pakistan had a very unfortunate flood. We treated about 30,000 of, uh, uh, of the victims. With our employees, we started training, we started HSC practices, we brought down injuries by 20% year on year. With the media, customer care didn't exist. Simple stuff that until we didn't ge increase generation capacity, there was load shedding. By simply telling households that when the load shedding would happen, we improved their lives tremendously. They could plan around the load shedding. Customer care didn't exist, customer care centers didn't exist. We rehabilitated those. We brought in new employees. We painted the dump. We made them pleasant places to come. We actually picked up phones and trained people to provide basic things which we all take for granted. They just didn't exist. It took us two, three years to win over different stakeholders. I mean, our biggest, the, 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 the business people wouldn't pay us bills. The army, the government would pay us bills. We cut off their electricity. Right, much to our peril. But today, KESC, all of these financial, all of these changes that I just outlined, the financial impact has been tremendous. We maximized in fiscal year 12 our highest ever profitability that KESC has ever achieved, $188 million in EBITDA. We have, through uh, the 1,000 megawatts of addition, we have probably, McKinsey estimates, a billion to two billion dollars of economic enhancement annually in Karachi's economy. And none of this, none of this could have been possible without a multi-stakeholder embedded approach, mm -hmm. which continues to be the case even today. Mm -hmm. I mean, Don, your history has been more in traditional investments, but now you're looking at different options. You mentioned two projects to me earlier. One is an yeah. training street kids um, in Vietnam uh, in terms of uh, F&B um, investment, and then a project in Cambodia, which yeah. has to do with water treatment. Um, sure. those, are, those are more sort of traditional, if you will, investments compared yeah. to what Omar is talking about. Yeah, you're right. I mean, our, our traditional business, which is our core business, is really just uh, private equity investment for profit. Mm. Uh, but as we move along, uh, we came across a number of smaller projects with really high social impact. Mm -hmm. uh, and on top of that, we actually started getting uh, investor or LP into our main fund, mm -hmm. saying, hey, uh, you know, we invest in your main fund, but by the way, my family office, we want to do something more, uh, <coughs> uh, more helpful or, or high impact. So it's, we actually start this out as more on an accidental basis uh, because we have people requesting us to do it and because our foundation also do a lot of work in this area, but mm -hmm. instead of giving away money, it's not sustainable. So we just sort of married these two together and we're starting this new fund. And the two projects that we're looking at now uh, as basically our first two projects, one is actually having uh, a uh, training center really for street kids or kids with high risk uh, where we give them training in mostly F&B or hospitality, and then we will then place them in hotel, restaurant, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, and mostly waiter, waiters, more, smaller scale, training them in English. So basically, this we saw, find that this is a really major impact where you have, you're taking kids off the street, off drugs, and off all the bad stuff, and moving to a really career path. And, and once they're given an opportunity we find that these are one of the best performers. When we go back to the hotel and the restaurant, we ask them, these are the kids that work the hardest mm -hmm. and they have a new mission in life. So we find that it's really uh, rewarding. Uh, so that's one project where we take the kids off the street, train them and place them with employment and they, they, they be more accountable and responsible. 
The other uh, project we're looking at in Cambodia is quite interesting. Uh, it's, it's actually run by an entrepreneur. And what he does is uh, he builds this small micro water treatment plant, uh, which this is then- a, This is local? This is local, local uh, in Cambodia. Right. It's a small company, a small enterprise in Cambodia that uh, it's not really a high tech, but it's very basic water treatment, a small water treatment plant, mm -hmm. essentially providing clean water to its village. Initially, that's how it started, because its village doesn't have access to clean water, and people get sick all the time when using the water, the dirty water. And so they started this and, and you know, become very, I wouldn't say very profitable, but profitable. Uh, typically, each one of these water treatment plants serves about 5,000 households. And it costs about three hundred dollars to actually serve one household, uh, and you know you can make money back in about five years or so, which is a pretty good return. Mm -hmm. But the key here is that you reduce the number of sickness in the village, and people actually have access to clean water. Mm -hmm. And and we thought that's a great idea, and so that's the second project we're looking at in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And this is through the foundation. This part is a, of this would be a new uh, social impact investment fund, not okay. our regular fund, but okay. it will be run by our foundation uh, with the support of our investment team on the regular investment side. Mm -hmm. um, Andy, your focus is on microfinance, particularly with women issues. Um, you just said that you had a 0% default rate, which is really remarkable. Tell us, tell us more how you accomplished that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, is actually, um, what we do with, uh, in Amarta, in Amarta Microfinance, uh, we provide Loan uh, a really small scale loan, hundred uh, US dollar loan for poor women in rurals, and uh, we uh, invite them to make a group like just like a Grameen group lending model, um, and then we train them and we uh, inform them is this <coughs> loan is not just about the uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Now we know all our mics. It's, yeah, the, the loan is not just about the money and then they should give us back the money, uh, but this is also a chance for them to make a purpose for their life. And that's uh, what really want to educate about the uh, how we address uh, issues. Uh, we're not only just about uh, talking about um, access to finance, but then uh, we need to go beyond that like, yeah, um, we educate more about like financial planning and uh, participation for uh, uh, others' uh, services like healthcare or en environment education is also part of the the way we make a sustainable impact for like um, uh, yeah to address this kind of social issues. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, if you can give us a little bit of an academic perspective on this, you know, the, the metric issue. How do you quantify these three aspects, which is economic, uh, environmental, social, um, is, there, is there an index? How do you, you know, I know this is research that you've been working on. Okay, I have to stand up because I just feel so guilty for this group right here. So I'm going to do an academic stand right now. So <laughs> one of the benefits of being in academia is I get to hear all the complaints from the investee about their investors. And I get to hear what the investors are really looking at. And I get to work with the intermediaries. Uh, so I'm going to talk about it from that perspective. And right now, I kind of see two camps. There's those investing who are making it happen. And then there's those sitting on the sidelines, kind of like you all maybe, that are looking to impact investing as an opportunity. And that's what my comments are gonna be targeted to. So I'll get to your metrics, but what I really wanna focus on is I see two reoccurring themes in the impact investing field. And the first theme uh, is you need to take trade-offs seriously. If, if the markets could solve the social problems, wouldn't it have happened by now? And I know people don't wanna hear that, uh, but there's two types of investors I see. There's the financial return first investor, and under no circumstance will they take a lower rate. I also believe there's many opportunities and have seen these opportunities for impact first investors who are willing to take a lower rate for a larger social impact in particular cases. 
And as an investor, you need to really look at those trade-offs and have those conversations with your board and your investors and figure out where you are wanting to invest. Because I think we're kidding ourselves to say that we can change the world and make a bunch of money at the same time. And then the second point, back to metrics, the other reoccurring theme that I see is the social return on investment is never going to be as simple to calculate as a financial return on investment. And there's two reasons for that. One is what we forget about in the philanthropic world, motivations are driven by your values. Um, you know, so some people care about young children, other people care about climate change. It's really hard to compare a carbon offset to saving a child's life and a social return on investment, and I don't think we'll ever be able to do that. So one is personal values, and then the second is the time frame. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really important for investors who are moving into this social re you know, return on investment space. What you've got to be careful of, there are some social interventions that at year one look great, and at year five, you should have invested in something else if you really wanted the social impact. Uh, and so in this hyper world of quarterly returns, investments, and exits, a lot of the social impact isn't going to happen until five, 10 years, sometimes a decade. And again, so who you're working with and your investors, you need to have that conversation first around how you really want to think of the social return, what your time frame is. And I'll wrap up. When you think of your market expectations, I think it's good to match those with the market that you're serving. So again, there are plenty of opportunities to have a great financial return, have social value, uh, and have environmental value, but sometimes that's not the case too. So I've got a little a one page at the end I'll hand out. I really think it's a continuum of impact investing and the, just be smart and strategic and thoughtful of where you want to be on that continuum. But if it gets bundled into one you know, unknown dark matter, um, it doesn't move forward. And I think that we see that a lot in the field right now. It's a little bit stalled. Uh, and so we need to move these conversations forward. And on the uh, measuring the social returns, where I see interest and movement right now is going vertical. It's mm -hmm. getting people to go much deeper, either on energy, on education, and health, and just get past that you can compare across some of these um, issue areas. And so I've seen some companies in microinsurance doing some really interesting work around measuring deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, and so with that, those are kind of the general comments. Um, I mean, we have people here who are on all sides of the spectrum that you that you're mentioning. And Omar, you mentioned this you know, this idea of a, a very broad tent in which uh, you have, on the one hand, a personal moral uh, value that you place on certain types of investment that you make, and that's something that naturally we should all have. But there is ultimately a trade-off that comes, isn't there? between these two sides or convince me otherwise? I'm not, say, I'm not saying mm -hmm. always, but I'm saying in some cases. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to be clear is I think one of the weaknesses of impact investing was thinking I can solve every social and environmental problem without a trade-off, and I don't believe that's true. And right. there's many examples where you've had to underwrite some of these ideas for mm -hmm. three or five years before you know, they spin off to for profit. So I don't, I, I don't want to be kind of misspoken because I do think there's some, especially in energy and some of these, there's great opportunity. I think the trade off is more in terms of not absolute return, but timing. Mm -hmm. Short termism versus long termism. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're running a company for the long term, mm -hmm. then I think that trade off is really very, very minimal. I agree. I actually think, uh, although sometimes there's a trade-off, I would say in the work that and the focus that we've had, often there's not. There hasn't been because as the investments that we're intentionally choosing um, involve um, a longer term, uh, you know, commitment from us as private equity, then the the luxury is that we actually have <coughs> several years to grow with the business um, and develop those markets. And, uh, and just to kind of give maybe just to delve into a little bit of an example is that um, in, in Mozambique, for example, um, the government of Mozambique was having significant problems with vaccines 
um, not being uh, kept cold. So the cold chain into very rural areas. Um, our uh, a company in our portfolio was created. It was two nonprofit organizations created a commercial business, a for-profit company, um, and they are distributing propane or LPG um, in a supply chain that supports uh, vaccine refrigeration systems, essentially. Um, they now are going into the household market where most, most people are, are cooking with charcoal and wood and they're having upper respiratory disease and carbon emissions and all, all the like. Our interest in investing in that company at the time we did was actually because there's no other um, LPG company interested in being pretty much anywhere outside of the capital in that country. And so we actually see there's a huge opportunity to serve a significant number of people in a very meaningful way and convince an oil or gas company that this is where they should be in the future. And so similar to that timing comment is that um, what we've seen already is actually vaccine coverage for the population that they're serving has gone from 58% to 98%. In terms of quality of life enhancements, this is huge. This is in a what year uh, period? What was that? In a what and that year? was over a four year period. Um, in, in terms of um, you know, potential financial benefit, um, and in the household market as well, there's you know, some great data around that. But in terms of the financial benefit, we're hoping to eventually either sell this company to uh, an oil or gas or some interest that could continue to serve it efficiently, um, or to some, uh, someone who's interested in, in the distribution channels to those markets mm -hmm. um, in ways that can distribute things that are um, important to those, those populations, those consumers. Um, and that actually provide real services that can do it more efficiently now. So I, I think what we're, what we're trying to do is actually change systems, change the thinking that's traditionally there. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to make a financial uh, profit at the same time you're having the impact that you'd like to. And I, at the end of the day, I mean, we have, we're facing huge problems in this world. I mean, these are very serious issues that we have to, that are calling us immediately. And the complacency around that is just no longer... Um, uh, just we just can't uh, continue to, to face a world like this. So what we've got to we've got to do is use all the resources we can. Governments are, and um, philanthropic organizations are not enough to solve these problems. They're extremely important, but they're not enough. We have to be able to take commercial or private capital and channel it into solving some of these problems and use the market engine to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, Don, you you followed a slightly different model, which is a more traditional. Uh, investment group, and then you focused on the foundation sides and, and seeding smaller uh, in, yep. impact investment. Uh. Yep. Well, I mean, we, we, we look at a lot smaller business investment, where typically a couple hundred thousand dollar type of investment where we would see the business. Uh, again, also the trade off term uh, is timing also, because in our traditional business, we typically uh, funding growth capital or a company that got growing, whereas this particular case, typically we would say for the training class, we would uh, fund a couple hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is to just to build up the training center. We know we're not gonna make money uh, in the first few years, but that's fine. We know that we'll return the money maybe in the fifth or six years or whatever it is. But it is something that we accept that you will not make money in the first few years. In our traditional business, that's a no-go. If somebody give you that business plan, we say forget it, that's not gonna happen. So uh, yeah, this, uh, it's a different approach, uh, timing-wise, uh, and the, the, the impact investment uh, culture that's coming in. We say, well, you have to set this up, and it doesn't matter we lose money in the first few years, mm -hmm. as long as you make it back over time, and that investment is sustainable. But that's also with the luxury of having a, a side of the business which yes. is already successful, and they can subsidize it for exactly. a certain amount of yeah. time. Yeah. Um, I wanted to switch a little bit to the country we're in because I think we're all interested in, in the future of Myanmar. And um, you know, it's a country that's been dubbed the wild east, the, the wild frontier capital. Um, the, the truth, though, of course, is that not much investment is coming in. There's a lot of interest in investment, but we're still at that sort of waiting stage. And the challenges for the country, you know, whether it's uh, less than one-third electrifications, high poverty rate, 70% uh, rural population, um, the fact that the average student only studies for four years in, in school. I mean, these are, these are significant challenges for Myanmar, but there are also, you could argue, some opportunities for the country, which is that it's sort of starting on a very low base, and 
foreign investment laws are coming through. You know, it, legislation is being written as we speak. And I wondered if any of you had um, suggestions from your own experiences in these different countries as to how regulatory frameworks in Myanmar can be, can be put together. Um, and I know, Andy, that you had, when we conversed earlier, had some frustrations with the model with Indonesian governance. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how that might be able to, uh, what sort of advice you could give to, to those in the room who are thinking about these issues specifically for Myanmar. OK. Um, oh, my lessons from Indonesia uh, about the, yeah, about our uh, business in uh, social enterprise, and we are f uh, really focused on um, the mission for um, poverty alleviation. But then um, we see that if we really want to commit it and dedicate our time to this social purpose, uh, we really have to make the organization sustain. And it cannot be possible if we want to make the organization sustain with the uh, donation or we, we are waiting for charity or we only fundraising for uh, ev every year we need the new donation, new donation. It won't happen and it will make the organization stress. And of course, for that. And um, in uh, issue like uh, in the nation, like we need a government to support this kind of uh, uh, help the organization that really want to address um, social issues besides uh, uh, investment to focus on the uh, business growth, but also investment to make an impact for addressing uh, social issues and. Uh, we can ensure that besides um, the investment only for the business, we, uh, investment for addressing social issue also will uh, give a, will give a, uh, yeah it it will make a, the the yeah this we we can make the uh, the society yeah more uh, the wealth or the welfare or the, of the society is also improving because of the. We also focus on that uh, kind of um, uh, issues, and then, um, like the the we our government also we need to change the uh, mindset of our government, and also uh, maybe because we are uh, the business people here, and uh, we are uh, open-minded and forward-looking, we need to change. Like if we want to solve uh, or we want to address. Uh, uh, critical issues, social issues, environment, environment, social economics. We cannot always uh, depend and re or uh, rely on uh, NGO, international NGO, or uh, from the local community. But uh, we need to see this as a part of the business. So uh, we can make sure that uh, although uh, we want to have some profit from the from that, but the missions uh, of the uh, social purpose is also uh, 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 yeah, run in the right track. I think do, that. And do you think that there should be separate standards that are that these two types of investment should be held to? And if so, what can the government do to try to balance those two? Um, in my uh, opinion, uh, what I learned from uh, my country, uh, we don't have that kind of standard, they have a set of standard for differentiate between impact investment or um, business investment. But mm. I agree if we should give more uh, uh, added value for everyone who interested for the impact investment, uh, maybe like uh, any kind of uh, tax-free or um, more uh, uh, easier in uh, process of investment. Uh, um, bureaucracy, uh, more flexible, or that kind of uh, solution might be happen. Or, Chris, you would like to add more? Well, I can talk uh, maybe just briefly on opportunities here a bit in Myanmar, and again, knowing it's really limited compared to the people who live here all the time. So. I will say the common uh, theme right now is NATO, no action, talk only. Uh, and <laughs> whether they're the ministers, they're, there's just a lot more talk than there is uh, action, and for various reasons. It, it still is a risky country to come into. But from an investment standpoint, I would 
reiterate that, you know, match your investment with the market you're serving. Uh, what Myanmar needs right now is entrepreneurship and business growth. Um, they've got to buffer their resource curse and how economies grow out of poverty is building a middle class through entrepreneurship. And if I look at a lot of impact investors that come in with all their criteria and check boxes, I'm like, then don't bother, you know, because the starting base is at a different point here. Uh, you know, I've been at, I've spent a lot of time in factories and there's sparks going and they're in their flip flops and t-shirts and, but they have their safety goggles on. And so for their business owner, they've, they've made progress. Uh, I think the business opportunities, the business owners I've met are heroic. They've launched these business under uh, incredible circumstances. And to be competitive, it should be the first um, voice of impact investing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and with that, you'll get social and environmental. So on what I would say the continuum is just focus on business and competitiveness. And of course, you're going to follow their environmental regulations and things like that. In terms of regulation, mm -hmm. the country has many other fish to fry. Uh, than worrying about different regulation for impact investing. They just need to get good money in here that's treating the people well and investing in the country. Right, right. That's just my opinion. J just to follow up, I mean, you've been in uh, Yangon for a few months. You know, even in that time, you've seen more Land Rovers on the streets. Oh. You know, there's more building. I mean, there is, you know, the hotels yeah. are full. It hasn't necessarily translated into an increase, in, a significant increase in in investment in the country. There's Yangon and then there's the rest of yeah, the country. Of course. Um, and, and I think that's the big yeah. delta right there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think the people's lives in Yangon of having just access to transportation, which they didn't, cars have doubled yeah. in the last 18 months. So for those of you who are stuck in traffic like myself. Yeah. Uh, but what I find fascinating, literally, you just need to go 30 minutes out of, you're still technically in Yangon, but out of the city center and you're in the industrial zones. and. That's where you need to take a drive around the factories where there is no electricity uh, right. and there aren't those cars. Right. Uh, and again, therein lies a lot and, of opportunity. And in you know, countries like this, um, there is you know, inevitably hype, euphoria, excitement. All the investors come in, wow, you know, this is the new hot place to invest. And then inevitably investor fatigue, you know, unrealized expectations. How concerned are you about that in the, in the Myanmar case? Well, I think investment's going to come in in natural resources no matter what. So that, that train um, is going to leave the track. I think I've met some small private equity investors that I think are, and they've been investing in Asia for you know, 20, 30 years in Indonesia and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I think those investors who know what it's like to invest um, in Asia or have a huge role to play here uh, in Myanmar right now. And I just, I would say, come in small, do your due diligence. Don't necessarily listen to all the expert reports because all they've done is probably interview people. And unless they've been to the factory, they've tested something, um, I wouldn't put a lot of credibility. Right. And Don, you have... Uh, yeah, just, just want to touch on that. Um, I mean, two things, right, on the regulation. Uh, based on the Vietnam experience, mm -hmm. I would just keep one single yes. FDI law, yes. but make it simple so for the investor mm -hmm. will follow. But what Vietnam did was that on the top of the, the, the foreign direct investment law, they have something called the poor area, rural area tax incentive. So it's a, it's a blanket thing. So if you are investing in a certain area of Vietnam, like the mountainous mm -hmm. area or near the border where it's very, very poor, you get tax incentive. That's it. So basically, that's one way to encourage people just to go there and invest. So mm -hmm. that's where impact investment come into play, yeah. because you will invest in those areas anyway. Right. The second point about the hot money, uh, I mean, I don't want to compare Vietnam and Myanmar, but essentially Vietnam gone through the same similar process in early 1990 mm -hmm. when the embargo was lifted after mm -hmm. the, the, the Vietnam War uh, is closed. So that is the same process. A lot of money coming in, and it will come in, and until a certain period of time, it will be corrected. And investors like us who invest in the frontier market, uh, you know, been here for about 20 years or so, then we see those. And you're trying to avoid area where hot money is coming in. And always it's going to be the real estate that come up first. And then the rest will follow. Yeah, because investors are at the end of the day are heard, right? 
we just uh, sort of clamor in and uh, and it's everybody is just mesmerized by the opportunity Myanmar is today you know all sorts of analogies China mini China 1989 this that the other and it is it is a very unique um, opportunity and it's it's history in making 60 million people all the resources sizable in its own right but it'll happen gradually and that's not a bad thing mm -hmm. but the the local government over here they have a clean slate mm -hmm. right uh, there are a lot of people out there who want to help them, whether it's with their parliament, whether it's with their investment laws and other things like that, and they're reaching out for help. And that's, that's something that they should do. They should put in place, I agree with Don, simple, transparent, robust regulatory policies and frameworks. And policy frameworks where investors can say these are going to be there in the long term, and hopefully there will not be political change in meddling. I mean, and, and you know, there's a long way to go. There are always going to be local groups which are going to be resistant to change, right, who have been uh, benefiting over the last sort of decade or so. Um, but these are all sort of part and par parcel of the challenges that, you know, Myanmar will go through, that other countries have gone through, and hopefully they can now learn, being part of ASEAN 2015, and 2015 is a very meaningful date for ASEAN mm -hmm. with the opening up of, you know, capital, labor, and trade flows, they can learn from a lot of the mistakes that uh, ASEAN made and went through. I just wanted to ask one more question before we open up the, uh, for the audience. But uh, you were mentioning earlier the importance of investing in, in a diversity, not just in terms of sectors, but also in terms of gender diversity and the, the impact, social impact that can come from doing that. Did you want to just? Sure, yeah, I think. One of the, the themes globally that's come up in extreme importance, actually, I think, is um, the actual um, benefit in productivity um, of, a, of a company with diversity no. um, in general. And um, an organization I'm involved with is called Astia, mm -hmm. um, that's been uh, supporting women-led businesses um, based in Silicon Valley, but women-led businesses globally. Um, they've raised about a billion dollars for women-led businesses. Um, are finding basically that um, one, women-led businesses are tending to be, in terms of performance, more likely to, um, you know, uh, have an, an exit as an IPO, uh, have uh, higher rounds of next valuations, be more profitable ventures. Um, and part of this is, is essentially that diversity matters. It's not that one gender is necessarily better than the other, et cetera. It's just that bringing um, more perspective to major decision-making um, you know, um, roles mm -hmm. in a company, um, it matters. And, and so um, around, you know, around the globe, you're starting to see much more data around what that looks like. And including um, data that's showing that actually women start uh, women-led startups or those with women on executive teams tend to be focused on businesses, uh, at least two-thirds of them, that are focused on social or environmental output in some way. Um, so they're really entrepreneurship in the public interest, um, finding where those opportunities are in the market to do that, to find those synergies um, for both the financial benefit um, and others, as well as the, the in terms of kind of the financial or profit algorithm of the business is tied directly to, um, to those, those social outcomes. And Myanmar seems to have a, a head start on the diversity uh, scale because what Serge Poon was saying yesterday in one of the sessions was that women are very much at the forefront both in the household and in the workplace. Yep. He was saying that he's got 50 branch managers and 42 are women. So um, that's... In it's, terms uh, of gender equality, Myanmar has it made. Yeah. Um, and, that's, yeah, and that's certainly something right. that, you know, in your, what you're doing, mm -hmm. it's focused so much on women and the results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah if we like to invest in uh, a woman and invest in, like, in doing microfinance things, it's not just access to microfinance, it's property alleviations, women empowerment, and play a greater role of women in the family, they can, they, they can earn income, so they can just uh, play a greater role in the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I'm sure that everybody here has better questions than I do, so um, maybe we can open it up for questions. If you could please identify yourself and uh, keep your comments relatively brief so that we can have more people involved in the uh, discussion.
one there too. I'm Alan Miner with Sunbridge out of Tokyo. We've been investing in Japanese startups since 2000. We're also instrumental with some local organizations in promoting the idea of social entrepreneurship from then and sort of looking at entrepreneurship broadly in the society and where it can be deployed. My question for this particular type of fund, though, is how do you actually implement an exit uh, for our venture fund selling a for-profit company to a larger for-profit company is a very natural transition in terms of goal alignment. Uh, IPOs are a possibility. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm curious, with, even with trade-offs, how do you produce a return at all for investors? I, 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 the philanthropic do donations in America, that's an easy financial algorithm to play. It's tax beneficial to me to make donations. And there are things like orchestras and museums that did not come up in the conversation today as possible targets for venture. So I, I, two questions. One is how, how do you ha implement an exit without destroying the impact of what you had created up to that point? And secondly, where's sort of the borderline? Where do you see the borderline between philanthropic donations supporting uh, key initiatives in society versus social venturing? Questions for anyone that wants, I, I think Chris, you may have some some questions, and, and I'm curious with Kelly, you've you know, you've had an exit. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I'll I'll be the uh, not the skeptic, but <laughs> back to hearing all the struggles of exit. So um, in a, a previous <clears throat> life, in early 2000 in Silicon Valley, if people remember the dot com boom that busted, we launched a, a social purpose incubator. Uh, but one of the companies made it. Uh, actually, a few did. And just recently, that you know, their investors who invested in their social venture needed to get out. Um, and the reality is, it was just finding new social venture <laughs> funds to kind of replace it. They, can they be? It, it's a real estate hotel employment model. So, is really a Marriott going to buy them? Probably not. So I think that's one. I think you talked to Jacqueline Novogratz with Acumen Fund, and a number of their companies are really struggling with what an exit looks like um, in terms of, I think, the, the most common will be acquisition. I, I don't know any. Maybe you know that are even close to kind of being uh, an IPO, with the exception of I'll hand out this continuum, what is really more just good CSR, you know, good, com like Ben and Jerry's or Patagonia, but they're not doing a product that's actually serving the poor. So I unfortunately don't have an answer to your question, and I think it's the big question for the field right now. And luckily, we've got places like Bamboo Finance that over hopefully the next five years are going to be starting to have examples of those that we can kind of learn from to share with kind of investors when they think about it. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, I think our, I mentioned earlier about system changing and the, that example. I think there are very large national corporations and multinational corporations that are actually looking for growth opportunities and, and desperately looking for these kind of, of opportunities, but are not willing to invest now in the development of those, those markets. And I do think that it's going to take a few years and that that will actually be a very um, important way. We don't just transform you know, a few of these enterprises that are relatively small, but we transform the very large machines that somewhat uh, puppeteer many of our lives. Um, our um, our uh, experience has, has been only one exit, as I said, um, in a microfinance institution um, in Mongolia. And, um, you know, over the, the long term, um, I think we will, we will see a small percentage of our portfolio list on local stock exchanges. Um, I think there are definitely a few that are looking to list on, whether it's Johannesburg Stock Exchange or less than in India, et cetera, um, and that are actually very viable for the public markets. Um, others will, um, you know, be acquired. Others might not survive, but are worth, the, um, you know, the experiment and, and um, the learning. Um, we have had signals in our portfolio where new investors came in after us um, at higher valuation, 
And um, they're not all impact investors um, to that point, actually, some of which are very um, traditional private equity investors or local um, investors that are seeing this as an opportunity and willing to pay a premium to our, our last round as well. So um, in terms of you know, how our fund is valued, et cetera, it has, the net asset value is, in, is increasing. Um, and everything more or less is still alive, which is good uh, <laughs> in some cases. Um, but uh, you know, I think we still have a long ways to go for the, the field overall. The implication of that, though, is actually this is this, our funds are demonstration funds in the sense, mm -hmm. right? We want to show that there are you know billions or trillions of dollars of opportunity uh, to to be um, operating businesses like these. And that's going to take institutional investors to put money into these type of funds and to support the intermediaries here. And that's not happening yet. Um, I mentioned we have one pension fund. We have a sovereign wealth fund. Um, with those who are investing beyond job creation, so not just SME investing, um, it's, it's very limited to find impact investing um, institutional investors in those impact investment funds. Uh, so that's the, the goal is to prove that We've got a track record in the next couple of years, and and then hopefully it speaks for itself. There's a gentleman back there. Hello, my name is Onkoko, uh, economist of the uh, National League for Democracy. Uh, yes, uh, I like to ask you my personal questions. This is my curious questions, even though. I want to ask the opinions of all panelists about the impacts of potential breakdowns of the investments and investment impacts if and if the constitution does not allow our leader to uh, to in the coming 2015 presidential elections I would like to know your opinions yet uh, this is just my Personal questions. Thank you very much. Just to, I think, provide context, in 2011, there will be parliamentary elections. Um, the current constitution has provisions in it that uh, preclude Aung San Suu Kyi, who is the head of the National League for Democracy, to run as president. The constitution will have to change for that to happen, and that may be a difficult process. Um, so I think that's what he's referring to. There is there is a big political change that will be happening in 2015, and for mm -hmm. all the you know the laws and regulations that are being put into place now, it's not clear what will happen in 2015. And a lot of uh, foreign investors are waiting until the end of 2015 okay. to see what's happening with social stability before they bring their full-time investment in. So, I mean, you're you're looking at Myanmar. Does the 2015 issue concern you? Um, in a way, but, but not significant, uh, mainly because, I mean, uh, the two sectors that we look at in, in Myanmar at the moment uh, is mainly agricultural, uh, but value-added agricultural, not plantation. Mm. Uh, the other one is tourism, uh, mainly in hotel, because we own eight hotels in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also own a number of uh, agricultural value-added type of company in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and we. Uh, we know that Vietnamese agricultural technology is very, very good, and we want to bring it to Myanmar. And so with, with those very two basic sectors that we're focusing on, I believe that uh, whether the significant change or not in 2015, uh, any administration will support those two sectors mm -hmm. uh, because it's poverty alleviation, it's employment providing, uh, and it's very basic. Uh, and, and again, our allocation to Myanmar at the moment is quite limited. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a, a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. And so it's a good way to sort of test at the same time going to a sector that uh, we don't think politically will have any impact. Mm -hmm. So you look like you're about well, to... Well, I, I, I would just add on to that. I think there's opportunity to be an early entrant right mm -hmm. now. While well, the other people are waiting until 2015. Sure. You can come in yeah. and start finding the good companies and the good distribution channels. And yeah. then I'm optimistic it's going to go smooth. I don't know about the Constitution Amendment. I'm just talking about stability of a transition of government. So I, I can't talk to but the latter. This is, well, this is exactly, you know, frontier investor like us yeah. will work. And we, we are based in Vietnam. We're investing in Laos and Cambodia. So Myanmar, I mean, whatever we've seen it. before, it wouldn't be that much different, there, right? Yeah. Uh, 
Hi, uh, my name is Jack Sim. I'm the founder of the World Toilet Organization. Um, the best name. Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 the other much. WTO. <laughs> yes. Uh, given that a lot of impact investors are waiting for a late stage uh, success model, who is going to uh, farm and support the early stage and to bring them so that they are late stage to fund? That's the first question. And the other is, is there a role for a social stock exchange given that there is no speculative motive? Uh, you already have funds. So, um, yeah, these are my two questions. I think given the nature of opportunities in Myanmar, where you know, not much exists and there's the opportunity to build and invest across the board, you will see a lot of investors um, you know, who traditionally don't do startup or greenfield financing taking that route. Because I think the ramp up periods are going to be a lot faster. We're not talking about traditional you know, technology, VC, et cetera. The, 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 the supply side just doesn't exist, so the opportunity is there, and I think we'll all come in on that basis. Also, whatever does exist, I think in many cases, you know, many of the sort of more established business groups, or some of them at least, are you know, still on the sanctions list, so many of us can't invest with them, et cetera, and need to find, therefore, local partners is important. With respect to this exchange idea, I mean, there was a exchange, a social enterprise exchange that was set up in Singapore as a social sort of cause and exercise. And the reason that that hasn't garnered success is the sort of classic chicken and egg situation, in the sense that because in Asia, generally speaking, you've got a tremendous high net worth community who want to uh, do impact investing. The absorption capacity in Southeast Asia alone is anywhere, you know, 150, 200 billion and north, infrastructure, transportation, I mean, no, no dearth of opportunity. An investor and opportunity don't meet, right? And this exchange was created to sort of uh, answer uh, or, or put an end to that. You need all the cast of characters to make that happen. Even though you have an exchange, investors, opportunities come to that exchange, but there's nobody who has done the diligence for those opportunities. There's no prospectors. There are no advisors who the investors can rely on. And small investors, you know, who want to, in, you know, who are not going to uh, write the entire check but want to do smaller sums, they cannot, the economies of scale aren't there for them to undertake their own due diligence. They are not able to then, those of them who do embark and make an investment, there's no exit horizon. It's difficult to monetize that exit to, to the gentleman's point in the back. Third, there is no formal criteria in terms of, okay, what is impacting investing and what are you going to get? What are the return thresholds from an impact standpoint, which are not clearly defined? So there are these three or four sort of key constraints that are preventing that exchange from flourishing. Um, and, and, and perhaps it's probably very early stages in Myanmar. I think you'll see a lot more happening on a sort of bilateral basis before you, have, you, know, you start getting to an exchange. Discussion. Um, as a journalist, I'm very cognizant of deadlines, um, and we've been told to wrap this up at 3 o'clock. So just very briefly, I'd like to ask each of you um, just to give me an elevator pitch, 30 seconds of uh, what, you've, what you've learned, what you would like your last message to be to this, uh, to this panel. Who wants to? Um, okay, um, from me, um, what I, I really uh, inspire with these discussions, uh, especially um, uh, the, the eagerness for more uh, um, uh, private fund to invest and uh, to address uh, a triple bottom line, environment, social, uh, economic. So um, we need to promote more uh, about this kind of impact investing uh, to government, to in to ASEAN countries, to more private sectors. So uh, uh, I believe uh, all of the social issue uh, will be solved within our lifetime. So, um, and it can be An solved if color. everyone uh, uh, collaborate and uh, participate to solve this issue, not just uh, some kind of social activists, but even business uh, 
businessman and business woman, everyone can participate uh, to address this triple bottom, triple bottom line through impact investing. Mm -hmm. I think that's so I'm optimistic about impact investing as a field to grow, and I think there's, again, great examples out there that are starting to move the needle. Uh, I think it is a continuum, and so those coming into the field need to be really thoughtful about where they want to play on that uh, continuum because it's about matching opportunity with their expectations. Uh, and I would, because I think precision matters. Uh, so we need to do a lot more around being to evaluate the social return on investment. We need to learn a lot more about these exits. And so hopefully in particular in the next 10 years, we'll have some, mom some more momentum. And then I think there'll be even larger opportunities there for the field at large. And just I would close, I am optimistic about the opportunities here in Myanmar. Um, it's a fascinating country with just uh, amazing people. I think that there's a lot of opportunity in the greater Mekong area where we operate uh, for social uh, impact investment. And I think the investment is not that high risk as some of the people might consider. It's really sustainable. Mm -hmm. The return is reasonable and it's low risk. And I think that's where uh, investors should look into that sector. Mm -hmm. I would just say keep it simple, embody it in everything you do, and always have robust measurement criteria. Agree with all of those and say, I mean, just to say that it's a great time to be alive. I mean, they, we are at a point in history where we can look back and see that we've accomplished some phenomenal things over the past couple centuries. And we actually created the systems that are causing a lot of the problems that we're talking about now, whether they're poverty or climate change, et cetera. We are capable of creating the systems that address them in very short period of time. And, uh, you know, we are, we're, we're smart, <laughs> we're equipped. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about other things that are just silly. And, uh, you know, I think if we, we can also look to the, the next generation of, of uh, younger people in our society and see that they're demanding more. They are demanding more. And I think that's exciting and that's promising um, overall. So regardless of, of the industry of impact investing and how, you know, formal measurement or whether there's exits, et cetera, I think the business world is going to look extremely different and we will have the opportunity, and we do now have the opportunity to, to change um, and, and to create the world we want to we live in. Um, there's some very practical ways to do that right now, and we need to focus on the inequities mm -hmm. as we grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think all of you have done a good job of convincing a rather skeptical journalist that you know, it is possible to uh, make money and do social good, especially when you look at it from a longer term perspective. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from the old media business, which uh, I've been told is a dying field. Um, if anybody wants to invest in the print business, <laughs> let me know. Although I think, I think the uh, social good of it may be offset, sadly, by the uh, paltry economic returns. But uh, I want to thank everybody. There is a fund much. that does that. I know. <laughs>